as a leader abdicated. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Collapsing the wave function now. All right. In theory, we're live. People How noting many? they hope that YouTube works. So I, so you, I don't know if you. Oh yeah, you, you, <laughs> yeah. You hear about I this? Was here, mm -hmm. I was here for that last week because I was trying to to live stream it or to simulcast it. Break Twitter. break the YouTubes. Yeah, we broke YouTube last week. Task it, task. It was uh, yeah yeah it was a. Uh, it was pretty funny. So, you know, we started and some people were watching it and then people were trying to like rebroadcast it and they were using other services like, um, uh, oh, Ustream or something like that. Anyway, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty funny. Pirating our weekly space hangout. I know. I know. Well, what was, shame. what was funnier was watching everybody say, okay, well, we'll try to watch it on the Twitch stream. And I'm over here going, no, you don't understand. I pull it straight from you. Too, but that, mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's not going to work. But fortunately, it did archive, so I didn't, because I recorded it locally, and so if we had to, I could have um, re-uploaded the whole thing, but uh, yeah, so YouTube was working, it's just that it wasn't actually broadcasting out, so anyway, what's happening? What's going on? been busy <laughs> my guilty pleasure of the of the month is that i just put an order in for one of the new m1 macbooks oh right on today so i am uh first new computer in many years and i'm very curious to see how the new arm world uh is going to work it's like the same like they're gonna have that be the same chip in multiple devices now right it's the same one in the mac mini macbook Air and MacBook Pro, like low end MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And they're all seemingly just like stupidly, eye wateringly fast. Yeah. Uh, and reasonably and, priced. Yeah. I, for the first time in forever, I've just bought the cheapest one basically because mm -hmm. they're all the same speed basically. It's just like, do you need a slightly fancier screen? Yeah. No, I keep mine docked 99% of the time anyway. Yeah. So um, it'll be fun. Oh, and. and it's funny um, sort of watching the state of the, the COVID vaccines. Um, you know, they recertified the, the Pfizer one for like 95%, the Moderna one's 95%. So on the one hand, you've got all of these vaccines coming online at really high, like, like a coronavirus vaccine at 95%. Like, will, have they cured the common cold once they're finished with this? Well, I think that's what's so exciting about especially the Pfizer and Moderna is they're using this new messenger RNA technique. Yeah. Like nobody's ever made a vaccine this way. Yeah. And to have the first time you try to do it work two separate ways in less than a year with this technique that people expect to be very flexible. T seemingly might, safe. Yeah. Might 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 mean that we're sort of at the doorstep of vaccines for a whole bunch of other diseases that in the past we've had difficulty developing vaccines for. Yeah. And I, that to me is, you know, as exciting as the COVID part of it, getting us out of this, this world is the promise for what that might mean for all these other diseases that traditional inactive vaccines haven't worked for. Yeah. I just, I'm just so, so thrilled by that. Yeah, no, it, it seems kind of amazing. And so like on the one, and then on the other hand, you've got this crashing wave that's hitting all of our countries. I mean, I know you guys are having a really rough time of it in the US, but we're no picnic here in Canada either. And I know the Europeans are suffering. I mean, New Zealand is still laughing at us all. Um, but I don't know, they have five cases now, I heard. Oh, dude, it's okay, a, it's yeah, an epidemic. All right, all right. it's They've an locked epidemic. the country down. Yeah. yeah, my mother, my mother-in-law says Nova Scotia is up to twenty cases, and uh, so that's you know huge for them. Oh, yeah, in Fort Worth today we had two thousand one hundred. Is that just newly diagnosed? Yes, diagnosed new test positive tests in the last twenty four hours. Just in your in your town. And just in my, I mean, yeah. our city is a, a million people, but still, yeah, that's yeah. you know. Yeah, keep in lot. mind that the entire province of Nova Scotia is a million people. Yeah, right. It's, yeah, uh, I mean, it's we're not, seeing not good here. No, we're seeing like I think we've had thirty on Vancouver Island this month so far. 
Wow. Which is, but but that's the same amount that we had last month in total. So we're like doubling our rate. Um, oh, it works. Yeah, yeah I'm, in, I'm in California. Everything here went to what we call purple. So we've closed a bunch of things back down. Yeah. It's the, it's the highest level of, it sucks. Yeah. How yeah. oh, is purple the worst color? Yeah. It's darker than like, red. Man. <laughs> Yeah. So is black. Purple just sounds very like royal and happy to me. I know it, but it's apparently the worst. One. I'm gonna yeah, say hi to some people. I want to say hi to Alex Displant, Astro B, Bob Moeller, Brian Thomas, Brian Yuku, Christian Woodland, Corey S, David Dunn, Johnny J, Yorn Albert, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Luke Duke, Nancy Graziano, Noel Ruppenthal, Powell Zersky, Rich Wilson, Arjone Sergusi, Stephen Hawkins, Hawkins, Ted Krause, Trey Harmon, and Zap and Zap. And hey, everybody. Uh, so just like be safe everybody just tough it out i know this sucks we're almost there like they can start they can start putting up the firewalls vaccinating the first responders hitting all of the just a month yeah yeah so it's it's i know it feels like it's just going to go on forever that this is our life now but it's not Speaking of um, my power went out, we have a huge storm here. We had we had thunder snow, which is a thing that I've never seen before. Um, we, we had a we had a snowstorm and a thunderstorm, and we had re lightning hit really close by. Like you ever have lightning strikes and it just rumbles for for a minute after the strike? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was that was that was something. So anyway, and my power went out uh, yesterday morning at nine o'clock. And didn't come back until pretty much nine at night. So you gotta get on that solar panel train. You, know, I bought. I, I, we have, we had one UPS, which, which Carla was like, see if our internet is actually still on. So I went and hooked up the UPS to our routers, and what do you know? We had internet. Yeah. So until I burned through the one through the <laughs> UPS, took about four hours, and then we yeah, had we, nothing. We had eight we, hours. We had a we had a massive power outage here a couple of weeks ago and I, uh, or a couple months ago, and I had to learn how to get everything set up on my laptop so that I could run off the battery and then like jerry rig a whole bunch of things. Cause the UPSs were starting to just wind down. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I just bought a second UPS. You gotta get um, one of those Tesla power walls. Yeah. That'd be great. It's like co coach your house in them. Yeah. We, we, we talked about it, but my husband and I decided that that price point was a, a bit out of our reach. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a, a power wall is a little too much. Just another UPS. Cause I, I don't I, like, we run a UPS on Carlos computer. We don't run one on mine. And so the, the, the streaming machine, right. And so at any point, this machine could go <laughs> offline and our power is we're hanging. We're much. hanging by a thread we here. We really are. Stick anyway, We've been clearly uh, sort of stretching out this intro, wasting a little time. Um, I'm We're going a depleted to... crew. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to put you guys back in your boxes. We will uh, get started. All right. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the source of the plumes on Europa, the building blocks of life formed before stars, estimating the accuracy of climate models, uh, lava worlds, love it, and the family tree of the Milky Way. And we'll probably also talk about the uh, the Crew Dragon launch. Baby Yoda. <laughs> Baby Yoda, baby, that, that creature is a monster. All right, uh, joining me today, I've got Dr. Morgan Reinberg. Morgan, welcome back. Hey, Fraser, it's good to be back. And we've got Beth Johnson. Hey, Beth. Hey, Fraser, how's it going? Good. Now we've got a uh, where? Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, so we've got a a, a pre-recorded show, pre-recorded guest tonight, but I promise you, you are gonna want to listen to it. Um, it's Dr. Ralph Lawrence. He's a planetary scientist, aerospace engineer, and he is the architect of the Dragonfly mission, which is, of course, the uh, drone helicopter that's going to Titan. So if you want to know anything about that, you're going to want to listen to this interview. It was a lot of fun. And uh, um, to, that's got to gotta be like the coolest space mission in like <laughs> the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. It's it's unbelievable. Um, 
I'm I'm so excited that they're sending a, a nuclear powered helicopter to to Titan and uh, yeah it was it was an absolute honor to be able to talk to him so um, I don't even know how long the interview is hold on you're gonna see the interview for one second or will you yeah you will. okay hold on you won't how long does it go for yeah it's a long one okay so it's thirty minutes all right so so uh, buckle up. So we will go to about the 30 minute mark and then we will uh, get on with the interview portion. And again, like I said, please definitely uh, watch the interview. I think you'll really enjoy it. All right. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to give a huge thank you to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are, of course, our executive producers of this show. They're the ones who organize all the guests. They're the ones that just organize all of the, the journalists to do this work. Uh, we could not do this show without them. And I, I, I honestly think that if you're a space fan and you want to, and you're excited about new pieces of research, new news that you hear about in various newspapers and, uh, and websites, but you wanna hear conversations with the scientists working on that, by joining the Weekly Space Hangout crew, totally free, um, then you get to be an executive producer. You get your business cards, you get all of the credibility that's required to invite anyone that you want onto the show. And then I and my co-host will interview them in your honor. So go to wshcrew.space and you'll have all the information that you require to join this incredible community, hang out with all your friends, and decide who you want to have show up as our special guest on the show. It's not up to me, it's up to you. All right, um, let's get on with the news. Morgan, you're on my screen. Um, wh which of the three stories that you threw in there would you like to start with? Uh, let's talk about the lava worlds first. I yeah. mean, this is this is really cool. Uh, so this is a paper that came out uh, based on a Kepler planet, K2-141b. So, of course, as a Kepler planet, we found it via transit, which means we know very little about it. We know its size. We sort of can know its mass. We know its period. And that's about it. And what this paper does is take those little bits of information, throw them into a computer model, and try to simulate what the planet's actually like. And they picked this planet for a couple of reasons. One is it's only 200 light years away. And so it means that whatever we learn or think we know from a model like this, we can then check with James Webb because this is like a prime James Webb target. If it has an atmosphere, it's really uh, gonna kind of puff up. It's close to us. We can get those beautiful spectra from Kepler and actually learn something about uh, what this planet is like. The other thing is that its period is astonishingly short. Its entire orbital period is seven hours. And, and so, of course, the closer you are to your star, the faster you will orbit. And so this star or this planet is incredibly close to the, the surface of the star. Uh, and it's a, in theory, at least, it's, a, it's like a super Earth. It's got a mass of about five Earth masses. So if you take this rocky super Earth planet and you move it really close to the star, what do you get? So they, they threw in what we know, they put it into the model, and they tried some different uh, compositions for the planet, like different kinds of rock and stuff, and it, it turns out it doesn't really matter. They all give you basically the same result, which is this sort of like lava hell world. <laughs> Uh, it it kind of reminds me of that world from Star Wars Episode Three, the like lava planet. Right. So the whole planet is just this like nightmare scape. But worse. Um, Way worse. But 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 worse. Yeah. So of course, because it's so close, it's tidally locked, which means that one side is always facing the star, the other side is always facing away, and so you get this incredible temperature dichotomy. On the star facing side, it's like three thousand degrees <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> On the anti-star facing sides, it's minus 200 degrees Celsius, right? So that's that's like outer solar system temperatures that we're talking about yeah. here. Uh, on the same planet as like hotter than Mercury right. temperatures. It th This is a, a really sort of tortured place. And it turns out that 3000 degrees Celsius is enough to not just melt rock, but to vaporize it. <laughs> And so on the star-facing side, right. rock is being vaporized 
into a thin atmosphere. And that is only happening on one side, though. So you have the atmosphere building up on this one side. And of course, gases want to flow from places of high density to places of low density. And so that gas, which vaporizes on the near side, then creates these huge like equatorial winds that flow to the dark side, to the far side of the, of the world. And we're talking winds of, you know, five, six, seven thousand kilometers per hour. <laughs> so this is winds of vaporous rock blowing at 5,000 kilometers an hour. And, and then they reach the dark side and suddenly it's not 3,000 degrees, it's minus 200 degrees. And so it starts to rain. <laughs> And it, so it's Snow? raining liquid molten rock. And this is happening, you know, 5,000 kilometers an hour of, of air, basically, is a lot of air. So as it's like raining out in this like rainstorm on the far side, it's building a lava ocean that could be up to 100 kilometers deep. Uh, and then that ocean, because, you know, it's all piling up. You can imagine what happens when you pile a bunch of stuff. It starts to run back down. And so that lava ocean then runs back in these rivers of fire back to the to the hot side where the whole process starts again. Wow. And so you have a system that looks remarkably like the water cycle here on Earth, uh, where you have solids and liquids and gases and the same material being recycled over and over again, except instead of water it's molten lava right and, it's and the, it's funny that like you know we always talk about how uh titan is 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 like the the water system that we have here on earth except it's methane there and then we talk about pluto and how it's like the water system except it's it's ammonia uh glaciers but to but to go the other way, to go hotter, and then you turn it all into just rock. And I guess there's nothing that can make the mountains. Yeah, I mean, probably there are mountains that are formed on the far side from where the lava has flowed right. the other way under the cool side and is solidifying. And you could imagine sort of it building up this like couplet, and this is me speculating, you can imagine it building up this sort of like cup-like structure that is even gonna sort of help push the lava back towards the hot side because it will freeze so rapidly on on the cool side. Wow. So, so, so but, would these kind of look like almost shield volcano type styles? That's that's sort of what I imagine, but not nearly as symmetrical, I think. Right. Because you have, you have this sort of cold weather front where this precipitation is going to be happening all along this like disk at the boundary of the freezing temperature of the of the rock that is happening all over the the planet in this sort of like weird circle around around the planet. Wow. Uh, and so we'll be able to learn like at least what kind of rocks we're talking about when uh, we look at the spectra from James Webb. And we might even be able to learn things like the wind speed for sure because we can see uh, in the spectra we can sh see that being doppler shifted uh, at you know, th thousands of kilometers per hour. Uh, and we'll be able to, to suss out what's kind of going on here. And so wow. I, I like this because it's a reminder that like super earth does not mean earth like. <laughs> Uh -uh. It doesn't even necessarily have to mean, and like rocky doesn't have to mean rock. It just means, you know, silica yeah. is there. Yeah. Well, the, the technical term is, I think it's telluric is the technical term for a planet made of rock and silicon and oxygen and and not gas and and that way you don't sort of fall into that trap of calling it earth-like talk making it sound like it's terrestrial and this is just a perfect example but i wonder like w like we've been learning that that these tidally locked worlds if they are in the habitable zone are not as awful as we had originally thought that in fact, on the star facing side, you get these winds that distribute the the hot temperatures away and you get sort of a jungly um, climate on the facing side. And then you do have a very cold place on the far side, but it's not absolute zero cold because you've got this, um, 
you've got these winds right. that are just but when you're this close it's like all of that helps but it's not enough it's like putting on sunscreen on the surface of the sun sure it, it's helping you but right, right. there's you know there's too you're, much heat you're yeah. still going to vaporize yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but i'm wondering <laughs> i guess i'm just wondering like does an atmosphere of rock act like an atmosphere of of oxygen and nitrogen or is it just like is it is it too thin of an atmosphere but all like, like to are, are there rock clouds yeah are there rock, like Mi yeah. Minecraft, Minecraft world you got rock clouds hanging up there above yeah. the surface yeah I wonder anyway what a what a crazy planet I love our universe so great uh Beth what have you got for us all right so first up uh the first story I have is that potential plume, the potential plumes on Europa could actually come from water in the crust and not just the subsurface ocean. Yeah, so it's yeah. kind of a, it's a mixed bag paper, but there is, there is hope at the end. So okay. this, this research was published in geophysical research letters. And what they did was they used Galileo data of this 18 mile wide crater called Mananon, which is Irish. And I'm, I'm very pleased to learn that, to show that a combination of freezing and pressurization could lead to a cryovolcanic eruption um, or, you know, just that burst of water that we think we see. If those plumes were coming from the shell, they wouldn't, they would not carry anything that would, would be helpful for figuring out if there's life. So they wanted to know, does it come from the shell? Does it come from the subsurface ocean? So what they've discovered is that this crater that they're looking at is the result of a very large impact tens of millions of years ago and it would have created tremendous amounts of heat so you melt the surface you add all of that rock that just kind of came in you end up with a briny mix that then of course gets covered over because it's still frozen but the layer underneath doesn't freeze so it becomes sort of like this brine water pocket mm -hmm. And then what happens is, and this is kind of the really cool part, is that it can move. So it can actually slide around subsurface, under the subsurface, just sort of moving. And then it gets to, say, the center of a crater, like Mananon, and it, there's not enough pressure there because, of course, the crater is thinnest at the bottom. So it breaks free, and so you get basically a whoosh, and now you have a plume that's rising up, and it's this briny water. Right. Um, so, so, so hold on. So let me just see if I understand this right. So you, so you've got Europa, we've got this icy shell and then there is a liquid ocean, but it could be tens of kilometers below the ice. And yet at the same time, we see these geysers and say, okay, how are they making their way out? And the thought was that they were cracks in the, in the 10 kilometer ice sheet. And so now they're saying, no, these are coming from blobs of water that are trapped inside the ice. Well, there's two things actually that they think are going on. So yeah, the, the, the ice shell is probably about 15 to 25 kilometers thick, kilometers thick. And then the ocean is 60 to 150 kilometers deep. So there's a lot of range in <laughs> what they <laughs> think might be there. But when they figured out how this, uh, this pocket might have erupted, what they said was that the relatively small size of it um, means that it can't explain all of the water plumes that we detect. So there are larger plumes that we've detected um, from Galileo, from Hubble. Right. So this process is just one piece of it. So that's this is an impact event related process, but not necessarily the only thing happening on Europa. So it's not all bad news. It's just one potential function. Right, right, right. So, so I guess... And so the the initial formation is some kind of asteroid impact that's hitting Europa, liquefying a chunk of the rock, liquefying a chunk of the ice, and then it freezes over and you get this blob trapped underneath the ice. And then this blob, this briny blob is, is squishing around and moving and eventually finds its way back out to the surface. Basically. It seems to me that that under ice pocket must have a relatively short lifetime because it's a long way away from the heating that's happening on the inside of of Europa and so even if you had a tremendous salt fraction in that water the amount of heat you're going to be losing to space it seems to me like this couldn't last more than 
you know, not not tens or hundreds of millions of years. So this no, must be indicative I, of recent impacts. Yeah, and I think that's kind of what they, well, I mean, as I said, it was tens of millions of years ago for the impact that they were looking at. So not even, right. you know, geologically speaking, universe, you know, solar system age speaking, that's not a lot of time. Right. And I guess they're not seeing them coming from the bottom of the of specific craters, which is why they're getting this idea that they're moving around a little bit. Right. Well, and so the there's a structure in Menanon that they they've found. It's kind of a spider web structure. So it comes right out from the center, and they think that's where this is erupted. And of course, you know, broken the ice sheet a little bit, and so it's fractured in that pattern. Yeah. Right. Sort sort of snowflakey. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, you know what we should do? We should send multiple spacecraft <laughs> to Europa to look into this. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, Europa Clipper. Hopefully we'll get us some answers, but yep. um, that date, that date of launch is still officially to be determined. Yeah. Uh, well, the other interview that I did was for the uh, the director of the uh, uh, the Juice mission. So next week we've got the director the the interview that I already did about the Juice mission. So we'll find out all about that, which will be another look at Europa. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good it's a good time. Let's get out there. Um, Morgan, back to you. I think you're muted, Morgan. Oh, I thought Amateur. I had unclicked it. How about now? Yeah, good. All right, let's talk climate change. It's not strictly a space topic, but you know, hey, we like we like the Earth. You know, so scientists around the world are working on the next uh, big climate report as part of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, and this is sort of like the most important scientific uh, report right now that will sort of chart our best understanding of the way the earth has changed so far and what might change in the future depending on the actions we take. Uh, and so you can imagine that a huge part of this depends on the climate models that we've developed to predict what's going to happen in the future. The trouble is there are a lot of climate models. And so why can't we just go know, with the best one? Yeah, well, so that, that's that's the question, right? What is the best way to do this? And so this paper, uh, as part of this project, basically proposes that we should treat um, climate models kind of like we treat electoral polls, and that the best way to handle them is to take all of them and kind of average them together. But you don't necessarily want to average them all together equally, uh, because like you said, they might not all be of equal quality. But also in these really, really, really complicated models, there aren't that many instances in which like people start over from scratch. And so a lot of climate models are derivatives right. of other models and they borrow from other pieces. And so if you have six models and four of them are basically the same, you want to weight those lower so that you're not over counting that particular methodology. And so what this paper did is they took like 50 of the most uh, common climate models in use today and did two things. First, they performed this analysis to figure out sort of genetically how similar they are to one another. And then they looked at their predictions and compared that to what's actually happened. So, they, you know, look back a decade and say, okay, these models have predicted X, Y actually happened, how close was X to Y? And then they used those two things together to develop a weight for how much the model uh, would be counted. And, and it, it could be, the changes were big. So some models were like four or five times more valuable than other models because they were both relatively unique and relatively successful. And then they took all those weights and they averaged everything together. And what they found is that um, the absolute sort of worst case scenario is probably a little bit less likely than we've been thinking. Now, we're not talking a big change, but if you look at a range for a climate model and or for a climate scenario, so, you know, we keep we don't we change nothing. What does it look like in 100 years? Mm -hmm. If the old range was something like two degrees to four point five degrees of warming, the new range might be something like two degrees to four point three. So we're not talking a big right. amount. Right. And, and what they have sort of fingered this too is the sort of new generation of models which are a lot more sophisticated in how they handle the greenhouse gases and especially how they handle cloud formation 
And that sophistication has allowed us to way, way better model the way in which the atmosphere works. But it also means that some of these new models are incredibly sensitive to the actual number of, for example, the CO2 in the atmosphere. And so that a difference between 410 parts per million and 405 parts per million can yield results that are disproportionate to the fact that there's a natural range at any right. point on Earth of that. And so we're learning good things from these new models, but we need to take that with a grain of salt when we're looking really far in advance and these predictions become more uncertain. And so the, the big picture here is we models are good, in general, climate models are accurate at predicting broadly what's going to happen and that by combining them, much like we might combine poles, we can narrow that range of likely scenarios to and not overweight any one right. result. I mean, the thing that's kind of interesting is, is that you can do the math for yourself. You can take the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. You can take the temperature of the planet. You can take the amount of sunlight coming in. You can increase the amount of carbon dioxide. And you can pretty roughly predict the temperature of the planet based on whatever amounts of carbon dioxide you want. It's a, it's a fairly simple calculation. What makes it more complicated is will additional sinks of carbon come online? Will methane traps open up? Will will loss of sea ice change things? Will you get different amounts of cloud ocean acidification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so all of these models are really trying to sort of fine tune that very rough calculation that is relatively straightforward to do. Again, right. the basic picture of climate change hasn't changed in 50 or 60 years. Hundred, because yes, yeah, since since it was first developed. Yeah, but but now that we're actually trying to do something about it, we have these questions that are a lot more specific. What happens if I plant another billion trees? Yeah. What about this form of geoengineering or that form of geoengineering? Yeah. What if we reduce and those the, rough the, models the are yeah. Right. Those rough models are basically useless to answering those specific questions because they're only affecting one very small part of the equation. Yeah. But because the equations don't necessarily work in a linear fashion, a small change here can have a big effect. And so mm -hmm. having these sophisticated models is important, yeah. but we have to know how to calibrate our expectations about them. And, and we're doing a better job in this particular report than in say the report that was released four or five years ago. And it, it's funny now, like, I don't know about you, but I've come to rely utterly on my weather forecasts to, and to the hour. Like, yeah. do you remember as a kid them saying it's going to be sunny this weekend and then it rained? Yeah. Or it's going to be raining. You take your umbrella and, and, and it it's never, there's and it never, never a cloud. And it's beautiful sun. And yeah. those days are over. Right. We are now at the point where you say where the weather where I, you know, I want to go for a bike ride and I check. I, I ask the the uh, the Internet when it's going to rain and it says expect rain around 2.30 p.m. Yeah. And then I go, like, OK, yeah. great. I've got I've got three hours to go for my bike ride before the rain begins. And then what do you know? You know, sometime between two and three o'clock, the rain begins. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it demonstrates the ability, just the science, how fast the science has progressed in pure weather forecasting. And then they're taking that level of skill and, and, and calculation and all that and bringing that to bear on, on this far more complicated long term issue of just of the climate, but you can see it. It's incredible. Yeah, I and think I've I think I've mentioned on the show before that if you sort of crunch the numbers, hurricane forecasts today are more accurate five days in advance than they were in 1990, two days in advance. Yeah. And, and that's not some like sea change in how we forecast hurricanes. That's like, a, you know, a 5% improvement every year for mm -hmm. 20 years. And, and those that kind of accuracy is is saving lives. You know, yeah. this year has seen more hurricanes than at any point yeah. in recorded history. Yeah, five and days yet, tells you when to evacuate which places. Right. The risk of dying in a hurricane today is lower than it's ever been because we can say, yes, on this side of the highway, you should evacuate. And on this side of the highway, don't. That way we don't crush the the capacity of the road and we can make these determinations yeah and now we want to take that and expand it to a yeah. whole whole planet and and you can see that 
that there are these these moments where you're saying, okay, let's not let's not get to the point where the the methane starts to bubble, the methane hydrates start to bubble up, or let's not lose the 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 pole ice cap in the wintertime, which is kind of, I think, kind of lost. But anyway, let's minimize the amount of loss from green, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That each one of these these major events that we can delay gives us a chance to to minimize the overall disruption down the road. And I think it's 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 great to see these models coming together and the skill. I mean, unfortunately, the sort of the ter the, e the terrible thing is, is just that they've got all this data now that they can put against their that they can back check against their models. And every year that goes by, they get more data or more time to check back and see which was accurately correct. But you look at those numbers and you look at 2060, 2080, 20, you know, 2100, and you're seeing temperature increases of four degrees. Five. Like, how can that not be a bad thing? Oh, anyway. All right. Uh, well, I think we actually are kind of, we've run out of time because the, the interview, I apologize, is so long. I thought it was going to be really short, not like a more 15 minute interview, but actually it's fairly long. So um, let's wrap this up. Give uh, Morgan and Beth a chance to enjoy the rest of their evening. Uh, Morgan, you're on my screen right now. What are you working on? Uh, we're still open uh, once in a while at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. We're open on weekends for now. Uh, and of course, we're monitoring the COVID situation in, in Texas uh, carefully, but we've got to still have a, a great climate change exhibition uh, that I put together uh, in the last year up for the rest of the year. So I encourage you to come down and see some of the tools that we're using to, to make those uh, predictions and forecasts. Uh, and of course, you can always find me on my website, morganrenberg.com. And you did that, you worked on that uh, Lava Story I did, yes. Video. We, uh, at SciShow Space, uh, youtube.com slash space, you can learn even more about awesome. the awesome lava world. Yeah, remember, when you're seeing SciShow Space, a lot of the times it's Morgan talking to you through one of the presenters. Um, all right, Beth. Uh, tonight we have SETI Talks, um, starting about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, we are doing a talk on life on Venus, and we have... Dr. Uh, Clara Sousa Silva, who is also known as Dr. Phosphine, and uh, David Grinspoon. So they're going to be debating the phosphine discovery and, and everything that kind of goes along with that and explaining how it works. And that's so crazy. That's amazing that, that that's happening. Yeah. Um, I, you know, kudos to, to you and the whole SETI Institute team for doing such an incredible job of the outreach from the SETI Institute. It's, it's amazing. Like the, the team that the, who headed the discovery of phosphine and one of the most influential scientists working in the field and thinking about Venus and life and the potential of life on Venus to have these kinds of conversations brought to you in real time that you can talk to them on the SETI Institute. Amazing. That's incredible. You yeah, guys are that's rocking. Probably Probably the one great thing about about COVID has been that everybody knows how to Zoom now. Yeah, I know, I know. Everyone knows how to Zoom. Talks that way. <laughs> yeah, everybody's trapped at home and everybody knows how to use Zoom. So, <laughs> fantastic. That's incredible. Uh, if people want to follow more about what you're doing and what the SETI Institute is doing, where should they go? So SETI Institute is SETI Institute pretty much everywhere. Um, stay tuned. We have a TikTok. I'm not going to tell you anything more about that. And uh, I can be found at Planetary Pan pretty much everywhere. Awesome. All right. Um, well, I'm going to say goodbye to my co-host, but everybody else stick around. Like I said, uh, incredible interview coming up. So, and then we'll play that right after that. So, uh, thanks guys. And I'm going to say my goodbye now to the, uh, to everybody. And that way I can just shut down the stream once we get to the end of it in about 30 minutes. So thank you to all the moderators. Thanks to our entire community, everybody watching today. We really appreciate having you join us. Um, and we will see uh, all of you next week. All right. Stay safe. All right. Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe. We're, we're almost through this. We can make it. Okay. Here we go. So our guest today is uh, Dr. Ralph Lorenz from the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, Dr. Lorenz, welcome to the weekly space hangout. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, so I, the question I always ask, who are you? What do you do? 
Uh, so I guess when people ask, I call myself a planetary scientist, but I uh, actually trained as an aerospace engineer um, and uh, sort of straddled the two disciplines, uh, which is kind of a, a fun and stimulating um, area to be. Um, most of the time uh, I'm working on Titan, but I actually also work on um, the uh, Akatsuki mission, the Japanese uh, Venus Climate Orbiter, and I'm also involved in uh, the InSight uh, lander at Mars. Um, well, we're, we're definitely going to spend a ton of time talking about, about Titan, but it is interesting that your work with Akatsuki, it's the only spacecraft at Venus right now during the time that these amazing discoveries in Titan's, oh, sorry, in Venus's atmosphere. Can Akatsuki at all help with the observations of, of phosphine in the atmosphere of, of, of Venus? Can it participate? Un unfortunately not. Um, yeah. Akatsuki was, was really conceived as sort of a, a weather satellite. I mean, it has several cameras which um, can measure the cloud patterns at different altitudes and, and from those measure the winds. Um, it also has a, a lightning detector, uh, but it doesn't have spectrometers, which are you know, one tool for measuring composition. So, so it, it um, unfortunately can't help on this particular question. There are some hopes that... Um, one or two, the uh, one of the spacecraft flying by Venus on the way to somewhere else, uh, Bepi Colombo, uh, the European spacecraft may may have some spectroscopic capability that that could uh, poke at the question. Um, my candid opinion, um, uh, having you know done some um, extensive research on the sort of history of of planetary science, is that um, a remote uh, spectroscopic detection of of compounds can be can be very hard to be absolutely sure about. Um, and I, I think the, the, you know, the gold standard is, is for in situ measurements. Right. And, and there are proposals underway for um, some possibilities in that direction. Yeah, balloons, uh, landers, things that will actually be able to measure the, measure the atmosphere from, from inside. Um, okay, well, I just, I just wanted to check. Now, now let's switch over to, to Titan, which is, as you said, sort of one of the parts of your, of the, I guess, the worlds of the solar system that you've specialized in. Uh, what work have you done with Titan so far? Well, um, Titan is actually what I've spent my entire uh, career working on. Um, I actually started out as a, a young engineer working for the European Space Agency, uh, on the Huygens probe right at the very beginning of its development in, in 1990. Um, and then I did my, my PhD work in the UK um, building one of the, um, the instruments on the Huygens probe, um, the uh, surface science package. There's a little uh, a device on it um, that uh, actually measured how hard Titan's surface was when we, when we landed on it. I actually, I actually carry a spare, spare model of it around on my little keychain as a you know, souvenir there's, there's one like this sitting on Titan today, milled from the same billet of titanium and the same uh, pieces of piezoelectric ceramic. Um, there's another one in the, uh, in the Science Museum in London, if, oh, you're, wow. if you're so motivated. Um, so it was a real uh, thrill, a real privilege to have the opportunity to be involved in the development of that and to build it. And then seven years later, uh, to, to see it work for the, you know, the one twentieth of a second it was supposed to work. And the uh, light just timed out. Yeah, yeah, that's um, fine. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I then got involved in um, planning some of Cassini's observations using its uh, radar instrument. Um, and uh, obviously that uh, was uh, uh, an effort that, uh, that, that was, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years when you, when you account the, you know, the cruise time. Um, so, you know, I, I started faking being a geologist um, interpreting what we saw in terms of the the landscape on Titan, but but um, ice instead of rock. Yeah, you have to sort of recalibrate um, uh, in that the landforms look you know remarkably similar to what we have on Earth. They're formed with quite different material though, and and under different conditions. You know, the the gravity is is less, the temperatures are low, the atmosphere is thicker, and yet somehow these effects um, kind of conspire to give us this. Uh, very similar landscapes, like the the dunes we found, for example, are the same size and the same shape as the largest dunes you find on Earth. Yeah, Even it's quite they're made stunning. In very different situations. I mean, I I can't think of a place that has gone from really total mystery 
to the level of understanding that we have today. I mean, for the longest time, even with the Voyager spacecraft, they didn't have the capabilities to really peer through the the atmosphere to the through the cloud deck and see what was going on down on the surface. It took Cassini and Huygens to to get us that next level of what's going on in on on Titan. We've gone from this completely enshrouded world to this place that has, as you said, a, it's like a it's like a shifted the entire geologic uh, water system. Everything is just shifted one one element or I don't know, over. So the rocks are made of ice, the water is made of, 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 uh, like methane, methane, right? The, um, like, it's just, it's so weird. And then it also possibly has a water world underneath that, just like Europa or Enceladus. So it's the whole package. It's and a thick atmosphere and it like, it just goes on and on. It, it, it's got something for everyone. That's, yeah. that's the, um, the, the real real takeaway and it's been you know a very intellectually stimulating uh for me to have to um sort of you know touch on all these different disciplines i mean i you know i kind of got into this wanting to work on spacecraft and it was almost by accident that i sort of learned some aerodynamics and so on a, along the way and and then you get to titan and you find you need to understand the organic chemistry and and there was uh proposals to um you know, to have a, a floating capsule that would sail on, on Titan's methane sea. So then you have to become an oceanographer and figure right. out, you know, well, how big are the waves going to be and, yeah. and all that. So, yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating place. Well, and, and I know that there's also a possible mission in the works. People are considering a submarine to go to to go to. to yeah, I've been, been in, involved in that, that effort, too. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd say that's still a, a bit of a blue skies study at, at this yeah. point. But, um, but you know, you, you think about what would you like to do? What, what are the scientific questions? And uh, many of those can be answered quite well with a, a drifting buoy, you know, a capsule that just floats in the wind. And it's kind of romantic not knowing where you're going to end up exactly. But, you know, if you actually want to be sure to profile the depths, you know, is there layering in the seas? Yeah. Then you start needing to consider buoyancy control and propulsion and all these things and something like a like a submersible. And and I I think I recall in fact I think I saw you gave a presentation talking about how clear the liquid methane is on Titan. That's actually different than attempting to say communicate with a submarine on Earth that has to try and get its its signals through the water. Methane's actually not not that bad to try to signal through or peer that, that, down that's into. That's correct, but there's um. There's a sort of uh, funny, funny dimension. I, uh, for many years, um, you know, talking about Titan with with the media, and they say, "What is, you know, what is it like on Titan? You know, how clear is the sea?" And and my retort is, "Well, how clear is water on Earth? You know, it depends, right? There's the Dead Sea is very salty. There are freshwater lakes. There are muddy lakes. There are green places with you know algae floating in them. Um, and and I'm sure Titan has some places that are." You know, where the, the liquid is uh, turbid, um, but there are uh, others where it's probably crystal clear. Um, but the, the point you're alluding to specifically is the, the uh, electrical properties um, that um, liquid methane is, is in many ways a hydrocarbon just like uh, oil or gasoline um, and, or like plastic. And these are electrically insulating and therefore uh, transparent to radio waves. Yeah. So in principle, you could communicate with a sub submarine on Titan um, while it's submerged, um, just as you could on the surface. So what are the biggest mysteries right now that you have about Titan? What would you love to be able to know? Yeah, well, I mean, it's such a diverse place and there's, there's all kinds of places we'd, we'd love to explore. And, and that was really the big sort of challenge is, you know, in a, in a diverse world, where would you pick to land? Um, and and obviously the, 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 the trick there is that you you have a mobile vehicle then you can explore many places but even before cassini arrived um you know back around 2000 you know scientists were thinking what what will happen after cassini what will uh, the priority um questions be and um the fact that titan has this thick atmosphere and it is rather hazy makes it quite difficult to interrogate the um composition of the surface remotely you know there are ways of looking at infrared light with uh, spectra um, where you can at least make some claims as to, you know, this is rock and this is this kind of rock and this is ice. And that's very, very hard to do at Titan. Um, you really have to get in contact with the surface. And especially if you're interested in uh, a sort of higher 
um, level of complexity of, of chemical composition and specifically how far along the chain of uh, chemical complexity have the materials on Titan evolved towards those chemicals that execute the functions of life or in you know, living things on, on Earth? You know, could you have uh, sugars or amino acids or um, bases that encode information? You know, how far um, has Titan got? Because it's got so much carbon um, littered around as well as you know, water and, and, and so on. So um, measuring the surface composition, um, in particular in places where we think uh, liquid water may have interacted with the organics. That, that's the key. Right. Um, and just as um, uh, you know, Earth is uh, too cold a place for liquid rock to persist on, on the surface, so, so Titan is, is far too cold for liquid water to hang around. But uh, in certain environments, perhaps uh, volcanic, uh, or where you have an impact crater where uh, you know, a bolide has um, hit the surface at high energy, and has excavated a, a big structure and exposed material from underneath and melted some of the material. That gives you uh, a very interesting um, chemical synthesis opportunity, right. the products of which are just sitting on Titan's surface, frozen, right. uh, waiting for us to, to explore. And I think that's what makes it so fascinating is that you've got this situation where on Titan, you've got on the surface, you've got all these wonderful raw ingredients, all these hydrocarbons, which include hydrogen and carbons, you know, all of these things that are so useful for life. And then potentially below that surface, you've got this water, you mentioned one idea that, you know, a, a meteorite strike can can break a hole and allow these two, these two environments to come together. And that's when you might get the you might get that those chances for life where where chemistry meets water, liquid water is what you really need. Do you think that that this is a one time chance? Or do you think there are any like active processes that are happening today that are keeping it circulating? Well, the um, uh, the information we have from Cassini um, suggests that the ice crust on Titan is maybe 100, maybe 150 kilometers thick. So the surface is, is really isolated from um, that interior liquid water environment. That, that may have been different, you know, four billion years ago, right. but, but now we, we think they're pretty, pretty isolated. Um, there are one or two features that may be uh, cryovolcanic. Um, whether that represents material that's come all the way from the ocean um, to the surface or it's a manifestation of some near surface melting, we, we don't know. Um, the uh, opportunity for this uh, uh, chemistry with uh, liquid water interacting with the organics on the surface, um, that may be driven by the energy of the impact itself, that just the, the top part of the crust gets melted. And in fact, we see the same thing on Earth. The, um, some of the world's um, uh, richest nickel deposits are yes. um, at an impact structure in Canada called Sudbury. And uh, you know, there the rocks all melted with this giant impact and the, the heavy iron and nickel sulfides kind of settled to the bottom. Um, and, you know, it takes thousands of years for, for this stuff to freeze solid because, you know, it's tens, hundreds of meters thick. And similar melt deposits on Titan would have taken, you know, thousands of years or more to, to freeze solid, which is a, a long time to do the chemistry um, and is not something you can replicate um, in the laboratory on Earth, right, at least right. not with the the three-year research yeah. grants you get from from NASA. Right. So then, let's talk about sending a a uh, nuclear-powered uh, helicopter. And I know that every part of what I just said is wrong, but a nuclear-powered helicopter <laughs> to um, to Titan, uh, which is of course the Dragonfly project. Right. Um, so um, yes, uh, let's let's uh, let's attack uh, what you just said piece by piece. They, a, an um, RTG-powered um, you know flying vehicle. Yeah, so uh, a key point is that the Titan is, is, is 10 astronomical units from the sun, right? 10 times further away from the sun than we are. So it gets a, 100 times less sunlight uh, at the top of the atmosphere. And because of all the haze, right. only a tenth of that gets down to the surface. So solar power is, is just completely unfeasible. Uh, Huygens was battery powered and it worked fine for three hours. <laughs> but you know, if you want to have a sustained investigative exploration, you need a prolonged power source. And so radioisotope power is, is frankly the only practical uh, option there. Um, formally, um, the use of radioisotope power sources is subject to the 
is it National Environmental Policy Act? So there's some uh, formal approval processes right. before that. That's kind of a, a, a formal right. thing. But it's but a very practi- known practically, technology. Yeah, yeah. They're pra- pra- practically speaking, on, this yeah. is this is what 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 uh, this Dragonfly was designed to to use, and it's what's being used on Curiosity and on its right. way to Mars again with Perseverance. Yeah. Um, the vehicle um, is uh, an octocopter. Um, so a, a dual quad, we like to say. So two 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 rotors on each of four corners. Um, so it's a lot like a, a big version when it, the vehicle is more or less the size of the the Mars rovers because wow. it's the same power source. That's amazing. Um, but um, two rotors at each corner. So it's like a you know a little quadcopter you buy at an airport gadget store back when people went to airports. Um, but uh, by having two on each corner, that gives us a little bit of redundancy. Right, we could tolerate uh, one or more um, motors failing if, if it came to that. Um, so the vehicle um, can um, basically charges a battery up, um, tightens um, diurnal cycle. Its, its day night cycle is 16 Earth days long. So we're uh, on the dark side of Titan and unable to communicate with Earth for eight days at a time. So we we just sort of sit there um, and uh, we charge up a big big battery. Um, using the output from the uh, from the uh, radioisotope generator. Oh, okay, so it's um, not directly we also, powered we also, nonstop. Okay, now I understand. I yeah, thought, yeah. Um, so the um, a very important uh, other point is that you know Titan is very cold, right? The the thick atmosphere is at ninety four Kelvin or you know minus one hundred eighty Celsius, whatever that is in, in Fahrenheit. Um, and so to stay warm, right. we actually draw in what um, what might be considered you know waste heat from the radioisotope generators. It's not just giving us 100 watts of electrical power or 70 watts, depending on you know, what time, um, but, uh, but about two kilowatts of heat. Right. Uh, and uh, the walls of the vehicle have, um, will have a, a thick layer of insulating foam, um, and we're you know, really using that, that heat to, to stay warm. That's a very important point. It's not just the electrical power. Right. It's the same. I mean, it's the same thing that that in the end wiped out Spirit was not being able to keep itself warm enough to be able to keep its batteries right. pro, you yeah. know, working. So, so, so after after the tight night, you know, during which time we we charge this battery up, um, then the battery is full, um, and it will let us fly for something like half an hour, um, wow. and you know we're burning burning like ten kilowatts or something. I forget the the current number uh, when we fly, which is you know forty times less. Then you would need to fly the same size vehicle, same weight vehicle on Earth, because Titan's gravity is seven times less. You know, it's about the same as the Earth's moon, and the air is four times denser. So it's so much easier to fly on Titan, mm. and that's what we exploit. So uh, you know, I like to say in in one of these half-hour flights, uh, we might be able to go you know as far as any Mars rover has ever driven. <laughs> right. So then, I mean, what is the advantage of of having a vehicle that allows you to make these multi-kilometer science hops. Is it, you know, is it too fast to do science? Do you still have to stop and actually look at things from the ground? Or can you gather a lot of information while you're on the move? So um, the, the key science, right, the, the chemistry, understanding what Titan surface is made of, how complex has this chemistry got, that's something we do on the surface, landed. Uh, we have uh, drills, one on each skid, and a little vacuum system that sucks the, the drill cuttings into a very sophisticated um, chemical a- analysis instrument. That's the key size. We have panoramic ca- cameras. We have a weather station, a seismometer to you know, measure how thick that crust is. Um, you know, all that science is, is done on the ground. Um, and we're flying you know, only for, what, half a percent of the time. Um, that said, we are doing science when we fly. It's, I mean, it's a great uh, uh, perspective uh, mm-hmm. of the, the landscape. Um, and uh, we'll also profile the atmosphere, you know, look at the methane humidity and how the, uh, how the temperature changes with altitude and so on. Um, so, you know, the flights are going to be spectacular, but the, the key science in a way is, yeah. is uh, what we do on the ground. So I, it, in a way, we've, we've often referred to it as a, a relocatable lander. Um, because right. most of the time that's that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, the the value, of course, is that um, it lets you first uh, decouple the most scientifically interesting places, 
which are you know where liquid water will have interacted with the organics associated with a, an impact crater called Selk, um, and the safest places to land. Right, we just have mm, the Cassini data yeah. to go on, which is which is very good, and we can identify some of the terrains we see, like these sand dunes. So there's a, a large dune area to the southeast of the crater, and we are pretty sure that the areas between the dunes are going to be nice and flat and probably covered with some sand. And so we'll land first there because we're pretty sure that, that it's going to be safe to do so pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have a lot more information from the aerial flights. And we can uh, take off, we can fly somewhere that looks promising, and then come back to the place that we know is safe, right? And then look at it on the ground and right. figure right. out, you know, does this, is this the right place to go? And then we can sort of fly out over a third place scout it out and come back to the second if we're right. happy with that. We can sort of right. do this leapfrog. And, and I, I would imagine then back at home, the scientists are going to be able to look at all of the, the entire flight and go, you know, marking off interesting targets that would be fascinating to come back and, and take another look at. And so you may find that you're not actually making the distance that you thought you wanted to because there's just too many interesting things to, to look at. Um, yeah, whenever you go on a, a geology field trip, um, you know, there's these, um, you know, these two sort of two factions. There's the people that, you know, want to walk fast and get as far as possible. Yep. And there's the ones that are like looking at every little rock and learning everything they can about it. And yeah, that, that will be an interesting dynamic tension to resolve. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be I, robust it, debates about that. It's funny, my, my wife is a is a nature photographer and she focuses on on insects and so when we were first uh, hanging out uh we would go for one of, she was like let's go for a walk and so we went for a walk and i was like yeah that like let's go we're walking and she's like no 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 no, no. that's not how i walk we we stop and we explore the every leaf of every branch of every plant to look for the insects to find them because they're just going to be they're going to be right there everything's going to be fascinating if you're willing to look um with the with curiosity i mean a lot was done in choosing the landing site to give curiosity you know there it's it went to mount sharp and it's going to be going up this landscape that is sort of like this natural museum exhibit where you can go through all these different layers and see back through the history of time on on mars how much work has gone into the landing site for for the the dragonfly is it is it like because you have this mobility, does it become less urgent and you then can have like, you know, like a lot of different landing sites? I'm, I'd be interested to know sort of how that process. Have, have you decided the final landing site or is it easier or more complicated? In, in some senses, the, the process is, is easier um, because we uh, you know, were given by NASA, in fact, the, the, this sort of overarching goal of assessing habitability and um, the organic chemistry and um, when we looked at the range of um, accessible sites, you know, you have to, um, you know, land during daylight and things like that. Um, it, one, one, one scientifically uh, appealing site just, just leapt out at us, and it's the impact crater Selk. It's a relatively fresh structure where we can see evidence of uh, water, ice material exposed, um, and it has, you know, dunes nearby that, that will be safe to land. Uh, and, and at the scale of the data we have from Cassini, that's kind of all we need to know. There really wasn't a uh, competing um, landing site that, right. uh, you know, that we, we had much debate about. It was like, oh, yeah, that looks great. Let's go <laughs> do that. Um, now, you know, on the smaller scale, once we get there, um, yeah, there are probably going to be, you know, outcrops of, you know, icy material perhaps among the dunes. And we won't need to go all the way to the, the crater. Um, you know, we'll know much, so much more yeah. when we get there. But at, at some level, t all of Titan's going to be interesting because yeah. we, we just haven't accessed um, that, that, that world with the sort of instrumentation that we can take with us and, on a new mission. And there's no way you could get anywhere near the, the poles? One can never say never. Right. Um, so uh, our, our basic plan is that we will make one flight... Um, every other Titan day, so roughly once a month. And we can, um, you know, we can fly, maybe it's 20 kilometers. Right. Yeah, that, that's still under, under revision. But if you do this leapfrog thing, then, you know, 20, 24 kilometers is sort of two steps forward, one step back is, is eight kilometers for formal advance. Right. So you you right. can do the math. Yeah. In three years, that's 
36 months, that's 36 times eight, that's a few hundred kilometers. Right. But, um, but the, the, the seas uh, at Titan's North Pole are several thousand kilometers yes. away. Um, and, and they're in winter darkness when, when we arrive uh, and we can't see them from Earth, so we couldn't communicate directly. So um, I think it's, it's unrealistic right. that um, in our nominal plan, uh, that we would go all the way to the the seas now, and, and that's why you're thinking be... about a submarine. <laughs> yeah, so you know, the, there's almost no platform, no vehicle that you can imagine that actually wouldn't make sense on Titan somewhere. Yeah, you know, there are places where a rover with treads would make sense, but there's other places where that might get stuck. And there's, you know, balloons would be great for some places and seasons, um, submarines for for others. Yeah, um, it's a whole whole different set of questions. Yeah. Um, we will only see a, a, a region with Dragonfly. I mean, we'll get spectacular views over tens of kilometers, kind of airplane window views, and we'll sample the surface at perhaps dozens of locations. But that doesn't go anywhere near um, addressing the, the full spectrum of Titan's diversity. It's like saying, you know, to a first order, uh, we can explore all of Maryland or Massachusetts or something. But does that tell us what planet Earth is like? Not completely. Um, you know, there's still a, a very important role um, to map Titan uh, fully from orbit. Uh, you know, Cassini was just flying by and got these kind of strips. Uh, we've only seen maybe half of its surface uh, with any um, use, geologically useful resolution. And we could, with the right uh, instrumentation, do, do far, more be far better th than that. You know, you look at Mars exploration, um, you know, uh, Mariner 9 in 1970 mapped at a few hundred meters resolution. But, you know, now we have cameras that are imaging, you know, things this big and you see so much more <laughs> yeah, at that yeah. level of detail. And, and Venus, you know, mapped by, by Magellan um, in the early 90s was only mapped as well as Mariner 9 mapped Mars. Yeah, it's still so, you like know, Venus has a lot of catching of up to do hundreds of and, meters and, in. And, and Titan has a lot yeah. of catching up to do yeah. as well. I, I can't believe that we, you know, we really just have like literally one picture of the surface of Titan from Huygens. And we had no, no right to expect that, by the way. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. We, yeah. We, I mean, when we were designing Huygens, we had no idea what we were going to land in. It might have been uh, a sea of liquid me methane. It might have been, um, you know, sand dunes. It turned out to be a stream bed and perhaps one of the most interesting uh, landscapes we, we could have seen at that, that scale. Um, or the parachute might have just draped on, on top of the camera. We, we wouldn't have seen anything. We were, we were very fortunate. Yeah, yeah, but I can't... I, and so in another decade and a half, two decades, we'll see some more pictures from the surface of Titan. I, I can't wait. And, uh, uh, and a lot more pictures and a lot better quality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, it'll be, yeah. It's going to be tremendous. Yeah. Well, uh, Ralph, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. If people want to follow on uh, your work and the mission, where should they go? Yeah, so um, we have a great website. Um, it's uh, dragonfly.jhuapl.edu. Um, and if you Google me, you can find me and, and find out about my books on Titan and Cassini Fantastic. and other things. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today, and and good luck. And uh, I'm glad that that this is this mission is going to be happening. I cannot wait. It's it's thrilling. It's great. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, Fraser. Take care. Have a good one.